adoption in um, 2021. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wake. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> Tom, would, or Liz, would you be so kind? Um, <clears throat> all right, well, thank you for inviting me up to talk about climate change. I'm going to talk up here, be up here, because I'm a walker. I'm going to point at the screen uh, off and on. We've got about an hour from now, so I'll try to talk for about 45 minutes and then answer your burning questions uh, at the end of that. Uh, I'd like to start by saying I think I'm just really impressed with the town of Kennebunkport for taking this step at this point in time. Um, there's a lot of various strategies that are, are uh, isolated and by themselves to try and address climate change and uh, I think doing it within the framework of a comprehensive plan is really the uh, uh, most sane approach to dealing with what is a really big challenge. And the challenge in your comprehensive plan is going to be that you've never really had to deal with the issue of climate change like you are now because we know so much more about it and hopefully you'll know a little bit more about it by the time uh, we're done tonight. Um, well, all right, so uh, if, you, if you want to follow me uh, and you're all on Twitter, I know you can, uh, that's my handle, the climate doctor. So if there's, uh, go ahead, if, so if there's nothing else that you remember from tonight, I really want you to remember these 12 words, 30 years of climate research distilled down into its essence, essence, right? Climate change is real, it's caused by us, scientists agree, it's bad, but especially with good comprehensive planning, we can fix it. All right, uh, I want to start uh, by saying uh, I think climate change is the most significant grand challenge that society faces today, not only in Maine or the United States, but around the world. So I'm just going to provide you some framework for that. So you might think that childhood hunger and food insecurity is the most significant challenge. Right now, one in five children in our country is food insecure, and the ratio is much higher in other countries around the world. So that's going to be made more difficult or impossible to address because our tropics are going to be heating up so that it's going to be really hard for people to work outside. It's going to be so hot, it's going to be really difficult to grow crops. We're also going to see an increase in big extreme precipitation events, as well as big droughts, making it harder to, to uh, bring those crops in. So in the area of the world where the majority of people live, it's going to be much harder to grow food, which means it's going to be much harder to actually address issues of childhood hunger. You might think that national security is the most important uh, grand challenge facing our nation. The Pentagon puts out these quadrennial defense reviews usually every four years, uh, and in an 80-page document, there's nine or 10 pages dedicated to the issue of how climate change is a threat multiplier that drives conflict. The threat multiplier part is that climate change drives environmental degradation and social tensions and political instability, which if it doesn't by itself lead to conflict, actually enhances conflict. You might think that preserving biodiversity is the most important grand challenge. We're actually already in the sixth great extinction that the Earth has experienced. So there have been five great extinctions before. Humans are now driving the sixth great extinction, initially as a result of land use change, cutting down forests to grow crops, but now more and more being driven by climate change. Or you might think that the most important grand challenge we face is uh, public health. It's going to be made more difficult or impossible to address because warmer temperatures are going to result in premature death of or sort of extreme well, so warm temperatures that leave the heat waves are going to uh, drive an increase in deaths. But we're also going to see an increase in the spread of vector-borne disease. What's your favorite vector-borne disease here in Kennebunkport? Ticks, right? The tick is the vector for the disease, but we're going to see an expansion of you know, uh, mosquitoes, like uh, mosquito-borne diseases like malaria and dengue fever. Also, warmer temperatures lead to more rapid chemical uh, reactions that drive an increase in air pollution. So dealing with public health is going to be much harder in a world warmed by greenhouse gases. So uh, with that said, uh, three uh, things that I say in almost every time that I talk about climate change. The first is that climate changes. It always has and always will. The only difference is that today we have an extensive and ever-growing body of evidence that indicates humans are the main driver of that change. Once you understand that, once you fully understand that statement, the following is true as well. The future climate is literally in our hands. The climate that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and generations after that inherit depend upon the decisions we make about how we produce and how we use energy. We are now in charge of our climate globally, 
The second is, uh, I just totally reject this notion that it's the, it's the economy versus the environment. It's the economy and the environment. We have to deal with both at the same time, and especially in New England, so much of our employment actually derives from the clean environment that we have and the clean water, et cetera, and cleaning it up. Third is, after dealing with this issue for over 30 years, I find it to be a distinctly moral issue for many reasons, uh, but the two that I, I, I state most frequently is one is, it's those who are most vulnerable are going to suffer the most. Just look at any of the big weather disasters that we have, whether it's Katrina or Sandy or anything else. If you're young or old, if you're infirmed, or if you're poor, you are much more likely to suffer. Uh, most of us across, I would argue, New England are going to be all right. We're going to figure out how to adapt to climate change. But it's those who are most vulnerable are going to suffer the most. The other part to that is when we drove up tonight, we carpooled. We're good carpoolers. Uh, but we emitted a bunch of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that's going to be there for well over 100 years which means it's going to be warming the climate for a long time. We get all the short-term benefit of that, but we put the impact off on future generations, which is also really morally reprehensible. So it's a moral issue. We actually have to figure this out, um, I would argue. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna, I am by training an ice core paleoclimatologist and geochemist, say that like 10 times really quickly. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about ice core data, but I want to put the current context in which we find ourselves in the Earth's climate history into a little bit of perspective. And I'm gonna use that uh, using an ice core record from Antarctica from two different locations, one called Vostok and one called Dome C, and we've spliced this record together. So why Antarctica? Because it doesn't snow much in Antarctica and the ice is really thick. So when we drill down, we can go far back in time. Glaciers are these beautiful, if you go to places where they're nice and flat, you essentially go back in time as you drill down. So this is a record that comes up to the present, but it goes back over 800,000 years. So I'm showing you 800,000 years of Earth's climate history. In the blue, I'm showing you carbon dioxide concentrations of the Earth's atmosphere. And we get that by actually pulling these ice cores out and there's bubbles that are trapped in between uh, the ice crystals. We crush that ice core, extract the air, and we can measure the trace gases in that air. I mean, that's, first of all, that is totally cool, <laughs> right? We know what the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere was 800,000 years ago. Uh, this is ice core scientist gift to the rest of you. Um, uh, 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 and so uh, you can see we have this, uh, uh, well, I, wanna, I wanna say, why, why do we care about carbon dioxide? It's a greenhouse gas. I'm not gonna go into the physics of greenhouse gases. All you need to know is that a greenhouse gas is the same thing as a blanket you put on your bed on a cold winter night. You put the blanket on, you get warmer, you increase carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, the earth gets warmer because it's trapping the long wave radiation coming from the earth, just like the blanket traps the long wave radiation coming from your body. It's really that simple. Um, so here we've got uh, carbon dioxide, and then we also measure temperature by looking at stable isotopes in the, in, the, in the ice, which we then melt and analyze in a mass spectrometer. So hopefully you've looked at this long enough to see that there's this fundamental correlation between high carbon dioxide and high temperatures, low carbon dioxide and low temperatures. All good? We're good on that? See that relationship? The other thing is you'll see that this varies a lot going back in time. We've actually been through eight cycles of this. Right here, 18,000 years ago, when temperature was low and carbon dioxide was low, that was the last glacial maximum. There was nothing around in New England except ice, right? No trees, no forests, no lakes, no mosquitoes, no nothing. Yeah? So those are, uh, no, no, uh, th this is a, a, a measure of, our, uh, of Antarctic temperature, but this is the stable isotope of hydrogen to deuterium. And, and so the, the, the range here is about, uh, so it's a fantastic question, and there's, I could spend hours talking about it, but for, well, I want to tell you, it's about six to seven degrees uh, uh, cel centigrade Celsius shift. Although some of my glaciologist colleagues would say it's a lot more than that. So it's at least six to seven degrees Fahrenheit. Excellent question. I should have put temperature on there instead. Sorry, Celsius. Um, uh, so you'll see that there's these eight cycles. So, so they're linked and there's these eight cycles going back in time. So each one of these packets we call a glacial interglacial cycle. This is a glacial age. 
last 10,000 years is interglacial. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? These happen about every 100,000 years. And those cycles are being driven by the change in the amount of solar radiation that comes into the Northern Hemisphere. That's a result of change in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, change in the tilt of the Earth's axis, and a wobble in the Earth's axis. Uh, those three different cycles line up to drive 100,000 year cycles. So climate's changed, it always has and always will. In this case, primarily because of uh, the amount of radiation that we get from the sun. Uh, next, so I've taken those, I've, I, I've changed my y-axis, right, the same two records. And now what I'm plotting is how carbon dioxide has changed in the atmosphere just over the course of the last 50 years since we started measuring it in 1958 at Mauna Loa as part of the International Geophysical Year. So we started, when we started measuring it, not we, Charles Keeling, uh, it was at about 310 parts per million by volume, and now we're up around 415 parts per million by volume. The amount that the carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere since 1958 is equivalent to a shift that we see between a glacial age and an interglacial age. We've already dramatically changed the Earth's climate system. If we continue to rely upon fossil fuels as our main source of energy, somewhere around 2100, we'll end up at 1,000, 1,200, 900 something parts per million by volume, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will result in catastrophic climate change. Conversely, uh, if we invest in energy efficiency and renewable technologies, we might be able to stabilize somewhere around 450, 500. If you're really optimistic, we might be able to get back to 350 parts per million in a couple hundred years. But this is where we're going, and this is where we need to be. All right, so uh, that's the only set of slides I'm going to show you that's 800,000 years, sure. Uh, so, uh, so 800,000 years, we're not talking millions of years. Yeah, so essentially when it's really cold, the ocean absorbs a lot more carbon dioxide. When the ocean's warm, it releases carbon dioxide. So changes in the Earth's uh, orbits, change the amount of snow that remains in the northern hemisphere, changes the reflectivity of the surface, you start to cool the planet, the ocean sucks more carbon dioxide, there's more carbon dioxide that comes out of the atmosphere, it cools the planet more. Right? And then, sorry, wrong way. Did I say, did I do that wrong? I got it. Yeah. So it, it's a positive feedback loop. Once you start to cool something, it's going to get cooler because you're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And once it gets warmer, it's going to be a positive feedback loop. So about half of the warming is due to changes in greenhouse gases and about half the warming is due to, to reflectivity changes on the surface. All right, so uh, coming back up to the present, we're now uh, from uh, 2018 going back to 1880. This is uh, atmospheric temperatures, and I just want to show you that, right? Something happened in 1970. We're on this long-term warming trend. 16 of the 18 warmest years have occurred uh, since 2000. Don't let anybody tell you that the earth warming has stopped, right? It has continued, it goes in cycles. There's reasons for that, but there's this long-term increase. A little more shocking than that is that the atmosphere really only contains about 10% of the increase in energy as a result of the increase in greenhouse gases. 90% of the energy is now stored in the ocean. So what you're seeing here is the heat content. It doesn't change the temperature so much because the ocean is so huge. It's got a much bigger thermal mass. But the amount of energy stored in the ocean has increased substantially. So you'll see that uh, the red lines uh, represent different oceans of the world, the different red lines, the surface to 2,300 feet, and then 2,300 feet to 6,560 feet. The, the, the amount of energy stored in the ocean is huge. So you can also thank your ocean for actually absorbing a lot of the energy, because if it wasn't there, the atmosphere would be a lot hotter. All right, uh, just a couple of other global records before we dive into what's happening in New England and, and Maine. Um, this is a really important record. Uh, we first start tracking the extent of Arctic sea ice in 1979 when we put sat polar orbiting satellites up. And what I have plotted here is the end uh, uh, of September, or so the month of September sea ice extent, which is the smallest extent of Arctic sea ice. It's when it's the warmest in the Arctic. It sort of takes a while for, for it to warm up. You'll see back here we had sort of somewhere between seven and eight million square kilometers in 1979, and now we're down to about 
right? On average, we've lost 11% of the area of Arctic sea ice every decade since 1979. Why do you care? Arctic sea ice is white and it reflects solar radiation back out into space. When you remove that Arctic sea ice, you get ocean water that's dark and it's also opaque, so the sun comes in and it heats up the surface of the ocean, you know, the upper uh, five to 10 meters, and it retains that heat. So you, you lose Arctic sea ice, you lose the air conditioner for the Northern Hemisphere, and the best estimates are now are that uh, this Arctic sea ice will completely disappear in a decade or two, and we're not gonna get it back because the ocean is going to be warming. Um, not only are we reducing the extent of Arctic sea ice, but we're also reducing the age of Arctic sea ice. This is a little bit hard to see, uh, but down here what you have is the age of sea ice in years with the dark, dark blue as one year and the white as nine years old. So nine-year-old sea ice is going to be 40 to 50 feet thick. Really, really thick. One-year-old sea ice might be 10 feet thick, so a little bit higher than this room. So you see up here, uh, late March in 1990, right, you've got lots of sea ice that is uh, older than five, six, seven, eight, nine years. It's very thick. It's resilient to a particularly warm summer. Come back to late March 2016, right, there's much less and almost no really old sea ice. It's all very young sea ice, which means it's thin, which means it's really vulnerable to warm Arctic summers. All right, so we're going to move from land, uh, sea ice to land ice. Uh, I'm going to talk about Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, here's a nice picture of Greenland over there. Uh, this is a graph that goes from 2002 to 2016 that shows the mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet. So how much mass it gains in the wintertime when the snow falls and stays there, and the mass that it loses in summertime when it melts or when big... Uh, uh, ice flows calve off uh, of the glaciers that drain the ice sheet. So you can see long term, we're losing considerable amount of mass on the Greenland ice sheet. And most of that mass is being uh, driven where these really big glaciers drain the Greenland ice sheet. This one is a pretty famous glacier called Jakob Sabin. Uh, uh, used you probably still is one of the fastest flowing glaciers in the world, but it's, it's draining this huge watershed, essentially our ice shed of Greenland. So on average, Greenland is losing 281 gigatons of ice per year. So what does that mean? What's a gigaton of ice? It's a lot of ice. <laughs> so a gigaton, it's a billion tons of ice, right? How much is one gigaton, one billion tons of ice? So uh, 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So how do you even figure that out? I mean, can you picture that? Uh, so a better analogy that I came across uh, was if you put a piece of ice down in Washington, D.C. that went from uh, the um, Capitol building to uh, the Lincoln Memorial, the entire width of the wall, three times higher than the Washington Monument, that would be one gigaton of ice. So we're losing... 200, on average, 280 of those per year. It's the equivalent of r rising sea level about two-thirds of a millimeter per year. Uh, so we're also losing ice from Antarctica at about half the rate of Greenland, 125 gigatons per year. So that's about one-third of a millimeter. And most of it's coming from West Antarctica, also from those really big glaciers uh, that drain the, the part of the West Antarctic ice sheet, so this part of the ice sheet. The challenge with Antarctica is there's a lot more ice to lose, and it looks like the rate at which ice is being lost is speeding up much more quickly in Antarctica. So all of the uncertainty that we have in sea level rise out by 2100 is actually driven by the ice dynamics that we don't fully understand for Antarctica um, uh, that we're doing a lot of work to try and figure out. And then that is contributing to uh, sea level rise, both the warming and uh, the ice melt. The sea ice doesn't contribute to sea level rise because it's already in the water. So this is a long-term record of sea level as a, uh, measured by, uh, from a, a, a series of different satellites that were designed to, to measure the, the height of sea, of seawater. Uh, the red line represents the increase in sea level rise as a result of increase in the temperature of water, which means it's going to, as it gets warmer, it gets less dense, so it takes up more volume. And then the blue line represents the transfer of uh, ice, of water in the form of ice from the land into the ocean. Uh, so that's the global mean ocean mass. And you can begin to see that this is beginning to hit an exponential curve. So exactly how fast this increases is going to dictate how fast our seas rise. <laughs> 
And then here's uh, the main driver of it all. So I started off talking about carbon dioxide from an ice core. Here's the Mauna Loa record of carbon dioxide right up through 2019. And you can see we're now up 415 parts per million by volume. Uh, where's all that carbon dioxide? Uh, uh, sorry, what's the breakdown of uh, greenhouse gases? I talk primarily about carbon dioxide. It's not the only greenhouse gas. There's carbon dioxide that comes from fossil fuels. It's carbon dioxide that comes from land use changes, primarily when we cut down trees and burn them, but also uh, how we actually uh, use our soils. There's carbon dioxide associated with chemical processes. Methane, a lot of methane comes from anaerobic processes. So anytime we grow crops that are underwater, uh, also sort of, right, we all know that cows now actually burp a lot of methane. It's a real uh, challenge. Nitrous oxide primarily coming from our agricultural systems and then CFCs, man-made uh, greenhouse gases. So CO2 from fossil fuels is the biggest one, but you can't solve the problem just by looking at that. You have to actually look at the rest of the greenhouse gases as well. And here's just how they're broken down by sources, right? You can see electricity and transportation close to 50%, industry about 25%, right? Food and land use about 25%, then some other small stuff. But again, you can't just work on the electricity part of the problem or just on the food part or just on the industry part or just on the transportation part. We have to deal with all of these at the same time. I'm going to skip that slide. <laughs> I'm going to skip that one too. All right, so I want to transition into what's happening in Maine. Um, I should add that, uh, that you're going to have access to the PowerPoint, and on all the slides I have various sources, and then at the end I have a particular set of sources that I think are really valuable uh, for you in Maine. Um, uh, so for example, a lot of uh, the figures I'm going to show you now come from Maine's Climate Future, which was a report written by scientists from the University of Maine. It's a really good document. I wrote a similar document for New Hampshire, but we're not in New Hampshire, right? We're in Maine. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to show you long-term Maine's annual average temperature. It is, in fact, getting warmer, right? It's increased a lot since 1895. But if you look at this closely, the rate of increase has actually made much steeper since 1970, right? So we're, we're, we're heating up much more quickly over the last past 50 years. Um, uh, there's a really interesting uh, uh, atmospheric uh, circulation changes that are related to sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. It's called the Atlantic Meridional uh, Oscillation. Um, and it's, we have sort of warm phases and cold phases depending on exactly how warm or cold the bodies of water in the North Atlantic are. Um, so temperature uh, degree, this is sea surface temperature, right? We have warm phases and cool phases. So that's actually reflected in Maine's temperature. So so you might call this natural oscillations, but you'll see that the warmer events are getting warmer and the cooler events are getting warmer. So this is my, uh, uh, my reference to we have to learn how to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Climate does not just change for one reason, right? Does it change naturally? Yes. Does it change because of human beings? Yes, we have to put those two together so you get cycles but you get trends over time. So the overall trend is to warming, even though we have to deal with the cyclicity. Um, we've also seen an increase in precipitation. Uh, you can see lots of variability. You might even say you think that variability might be getting bigger. Uh, that's a pretty big challenge to actually prove statistically, but we are seeing an increase in precipitation. And I would argue that's really good because Maine and New England has a lot of fresh water, and we're going to continue to have a lot of fresh water because of rain. There's other parts in the USA that are facing significant drought. And I would argue they might be looking to New England to say, wow, they have water up there that maybe we should go up there because I've been really thirsty living in Tucson or uh, somewhere else. So I, I think this is, uh, this, this is going to present some challenges as well I'll get into. But this is something we need to begin thinking about is how we preserve what is a really precious resource. So the challenge is that more of that rain is coming in fewer events. Uh, this is actually from a NOAA state climate summary. So this comes right from the, the most recent national climate assessment. And what you're looking at is change in the magnitude of the 24-hour, 100-year precipitation event, which is the design event for a lot of uh, the flooding. 
uh, it, it helps define what the 100-year floodplains are, for example. And you'll see, right, coastal Maine is right in the spotlight of having an increase in that amount on the order of 20 to 30 percent. Let me show you what that actually means on the ground. Oops, go, go one more. No, go forward one more. Uh, uh. There we go. So that's, that's the one I wanted. Um, so there's these updated extreme rainfall climatology. So if any of you were engineers designing 20 years ago and you uh, tried to get a site plan permit for somewhere that was near a floodplain, you would have gone to this document called Technical Paper 40 that was published in 1961 that told you that that 24-year, 100-year rainfall was 6.3 inches in uh, coastal New Hampshire and coastal southern Maine. So that analysis has now been redone by different entities. One group that's done this is the NOAA Northeast Regional Climate Center. They have this wonderful website called, we just call it precip.net because it'll get you to the right place. And this is what the new 100-year, uh, 24-hour uh, rainfall event is. And you'll see down here, southern Maine is in the bullseye right of 8.5 inches. So we've seen an increase of 6.3 to 8.5, which is right around that 25 to 30%. But that's a big deal. Right? So that's, that, uh, this leads to substantially more flooding. And then uh, the NOAA Atlas just came out recently. Uh, it's hard to see this. There's a, there's a circle of 8.5 around Portsmouth, and then they put us in the 8 to 8.5 range. Similar, different sort of type of statistical analysis with a similar result. So the point here is that we're seeing our bigger precipitation events have gotten much bigger. Right? So we're getting more rain. But more of that rain is coming in really big precipitation events, which makes it difficult because that drives flooding because so much of the areas where we built in are close to water. Um, actually, can you go back one? <laughs> I'm just... Yeah, and so uh, this, this is a, an analysis that we just did for the Great Bay Watershed, and I haven't done this for this area yet, but we're looking just at the extent of four-inch precipitation events over two days or more, and we did that for... Uh, five long uh, 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 rainfall series, uh, the five longest rainfall series we could get. So Durham, Lawrence, Concord, Sanford, not far from here, and Epping. And what you see across all of these is this increase in the number of extreme precipitation events, right? Now we're talking not 20 or 30 percent. Like Durham has gone from, uh, you know, even if you take this one, right, two to three on average to six to seven on average, a two to three fold increase. And it's across all of these stations. Right? And when you're getting more than four inches of precipitation, those are the big events that are leading to flooding. All right. And not only that, uh, if you're living in Maine and you've been paying attention, you know that we have this really unique signature of sea surface temperature warming is the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the rest of the ocean. This signal has become crystal clear. It's really been developed by Andy Pershing at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, but it's really a problem. Um, uh, this is just, this is a snapshot of one of, uh, of the second hottest day that's ever been experienced in sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Maine. These are anomalies, so they subtract out the long-term average. So you can see the Gulf of Maine here, right, these deep reds, this is on 8th of August 2018, is 5 degrees centigrade warmer than average. That's a huge deal for an ocean ecosystem. And it's going, to have, it's, going to, it's going to be really big for our lobster industry. And I was just up at the Gulf of Maine 2050 conference two weeks ago. And uh, I heard that the lobster catch this year in Maine is down 40%. Um, and so is that a, a one-year like, one problem, or is that the beginning of the end of our uh, lobsters? So it's hard to say, but ultimately that warming is really going to have a significant impact on what is by far the most important commercial uh, 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 fishery to Maine, and it's already decimated cod stocks. So this is a really big challenge and something that we need to begin thinking about in our comprehensive planning. Not only that, uh, all that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is also dissolving in the ocean. And when you dissolve that carbon dioxide, you actually make the ocean water more acidic. So uh, this is a, 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 a graph from a paper written by Joe Salisbury and his colleague where he's modeled uh, pH acidity 
um, in the Gulf of Maine, and we've seen this significant downturn trend over time. There's only a few measurements, so he's taken those measurements and developed this pretty sophisticated model, uh, but we're seeing this significant ocean acidification. It's really a complicated problem because it also depends on sort of how much calcium carbonate there is and how much uh, detritus there is coming in uh, from the land and what the temperature of the water is, but this is a really big concern, especially for shellfish, because when the ocean gets more acidic, it's much harder for them to make their shells. All right, everybody take a deep breath. All right, we're all going to be okay. We all have resources. All right, so that's sort of uh, globally what's happened in the past and then what's happened in Maine. And now I want to talk about what might happen in the future. And our future climate, as I started out saying, literally depends on what we do in terms of how we produce and how we use energy. So because it's based on what human beings do, it's impossible to predict. So what scientists have done to deal with this is that instead of providing a single prediction, like you see on the news, like they predict the weather, so they do that because they have the short-term models. It doesn't really depend on what humans do. They have short-term models that predict the weather. They can associate probabilities with it. That's not how we project climate in the future. It's completely different. So what scientists have done is developed scenarios of how much carbon dioxide human activities might put into the atmosphere. And then we take those scenarios and we use it to drive global climate models, which are sort of the only tool we have to assess how climate might change in the future. If we had another planet Earth, we could do the experiment there. We don't have that. We're doing the experiment on this planet. So these are the scenarios that we have come up with. So uh, these are uh, global carbon emissions, right? This is historically what our global carbon emissions have been for the last 100 years, and here's what they might be for the next 100 years. And I'm gonna share with you three scenarios. There's a potential for a low emission scenario. This would mean a really dramatic and rapid decarbonization of our entire economy around the globe. I would argue that this is really not going to happen in the current way that the world is run. If we did that, we would see that global temperatures would really go up only another degree or two Fahrenheit. Right? So this is what the Paris Agreement uh, was about, was about trying to get on this pathway, but that's really, really difficult and really challenging. A second scenario, we're going to call that the lower scenario, is one where we com continue to emit greenhouse gas to the atmosphere to the middle of the century. Actually, what happens is the developing world doesn't. The developing world dramatically reduces its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the developing world, Africa, China, uh, India, continue to emit to the middle of the century, but then they turn their economies around, so we significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that, le that sort of limits the warming to, right, somewhere around uh, four degrees Fahrenheit. So I would say if we work really hard together, this is the pathway that we could be on. Next one. If we decide we're not gonna do anything and we just continue uh, to burn uh, green, uh, fossil fuel as our main source of energy, right? We see this significant increase in emissions going out towards the end of the century and uh, we have unmitigated warming uh, to seven, eight, nine, ten 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's this curve here. So let me ask you, what greenhouse gas scenario do you think we are on right now? You got the low, you got the, sorry, you got the, the Paris, the low, or the high? All right, so we're all in agreement. Next slide, we're actually, so when you look at these, this is the high, right? There's the low, there's the medium. That black line represents the curve that we're on. So that's, that's the change that we have to drive, is, is we have to bend this curve from being on the high emission scenario, and we have to bring it down so we're on the lower scenario. And it would be nice to get down here, but I, I find that highly unlikely. All right, so then we take those greenhouse gas emission scenarios, we put them into global climate models, we get the outputs in these big grid cells, and then we actually statistically downscale those again to get a better sense of what's gonna happen across New England or in particular communities. So here's what we've done uh, for the Northeast. The RCP 4.5, when you see that, just think lower scenario, and the RCP 8.5, just think of that as the higher scenario. 
Uh, what you see, you see this sort of bad hair day diagram in, in the back. That's the 29 different climate models that we've run. And then the bold line represents the ensemble mean, which is really the best projection that we have. So down here, the dark black line here represents what our actual temperature was across the Northeast. And the gray line represents uh, how we modeled that. So we're, we're reducing the extremes, but we're, we're capturing the middle, right? And that's when you average over 29 models, you expect that to happen. So as we go out in the future, there's two things I want to show you very clearly. By 2040 to 2050, there's no difference between a low emissions and a high emissions scenario. You all see that? It's really important. That is the amount of warming that we have already committed to. We're not going to get away unless there's a miracle in the way that we produce and use energy we're not going to get away from that warming. So we're looking at something on the order of, right, another 2 degrees centigrade, right, 4 degrees Fahrenheit warming. That's just something that we are going to have to adapt to. Whether or not we're on the, the lower or high emission scenario makes a big difference once we get out to 2100, right? There's almost no additional warming under the lower scenario. There's considerably more warming under the high scenario. So we have to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions so that we're on this scenario. But that's not really going to show up, right? We're going we're to have to spend the money and do the investment now to get the outcome for our great-grandchildren. Good? Everybody understand? So I'm going to have a series of these graphs. So now I've brought it down. So now we've got Portland, Maine, right? Kind of the same story, right? No separation uh, by the middle of the century. End of the century, there's a big separation. Uh, Portland, Maine was the closest uh, city to uh, Kennebunk that we downscaled to. We downscaled to places that have meteorological stations so we can constrain that information. Um, so uh, what does that mean? What does that level of warming mean? So I've tried to provide a couple of examples. Let's look at days greater than 9 degrees Fahrenheit, which is how we define a heat wave. Right, right now, in Kennebunk, most of New England, you know, we have certainly less than 10 really hot days per year. If we look out under the high emission scenario by the end of the century, you can see that uh, sort of coastal Maine down here is in the 30 to 40 range. Down in coastal New Hampshire, we're getting into the 60 to 70 range. But let's say, let's say 45 days per year at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's half the summer that's a heat wave, punctuated by slightly less uncomfortable days. Under lower emission scenario, we have far fewer hot days. Um, we also looked specifically at wintertime temperatures. Our winters have been warming faster than any other season, in no small part because of the dynamics associated with our loss in snow cover and how that changes the reflectivity of the surface. So uh, uh, minimum temperatures under the high emission scenario, end of the century, we see that, right, northern New England is 6 to 7 to 8 to 9 degrees centigrade, so call it, right, 15 degrees Fahrenheit warming, warmer. We're, we have winters currently like they have in South Carolina. So if you like to golf, we're going to have a lot more golf courses. Uh, under the lower emission scenario, it's still going to be warmer, but we're looking more at the 3 to 4 to 5 uh, Celsius. So, uh, so 6 to 9, 6 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Significant differences. In this scenario, I think we keep sort of winter snow and ice-based recreation. Under this scenario, we completely lose that. Um, interestingly, for precipitation, sort of it's an opposite story for the, from temperature, is we don't see any big difference between the low emissions and the high emissions scenario. So what's going to happen is that we're going to continue to see this increase in precipitation, but we're going to get more big events. And the big events are likely going to get bigger, and the reason is because a warm atmosphere can hold more moisture. All right, so again, this is going to be our most precious resource, and we're going to have more of it, but it's going to come more infrequently in really big events. So how do we think about storing that fresh water? It's a really big challenge. Uh, this is a similar kind of graph. We're looking at March, April, May precipitation. My apologies, this is still in millimeters, but for those of you that are good on your feet with math, one inch is about 25 millimeters. Uh, what I want to show you is that under the high emission scenario, you see this significant increase. So this is, this is the change. This is the increase in precipitation under that scenario. So we're looking at uh, something on the order of four to five to six inches more in March, April, May. Uh, 
And when do we have most of our flooding from fresh water? March, April, May. It's springtime storms. It's when the ground is saturated from snow melt. Maybe that's a tough one. Are we, maybe we'll still have a little bit of snow melt, but the ground's saturated. The trees aren't growing yet. There's nothing to absorb that water. So when we get big precipitation events, this is when we get our really big flooding. And our models are consistent in saying we think we're going to have more springtime rain in the future. All right, so I just want to finish up my comments talking about a recent report that I helped finish uh, with a group of really good, good colleagues in New Hampshire. And what I, I, I want you to do is, uh, for this next phase, is not think about New Hampshire as a competitor. I want you to think about New Hampshire as your friend. And the reason is because we haven't done this report for coastal Maine in a long time. So we've just finished this, and uh, coastal New Hampshire is not that far from here. In fact, we use the Portland tidal gauge as well as a tidal gauge at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. So the results are entirely consistent for this region. Uh, and I think we've done some pretty innovative things here. So I'd like to encourage you to, as you move forward, to use this report. Um, uh, Tom as well uh, is, is familiar with this re report as well because he was part of the review team, weren't you? Yes. Um, and uh, again, at the end, I have a, I have a, a link to, to all these different reports. Um, so this just gives you a sense of the number of different people that were involved in writing this. It's not sort of the world according to Cameron Wake. Uh, there was a whole group of scientists, primarily from the University of New Hampshire. We had some superb external reviewers who are uh, experts in coastal uh, flood risk. And we had a really big steering committee. And then we had technical advisors and adaptation practitioners. So this report has been read by a lot of people. It's been reviewed by a lot of people. And I would argue it's very, very grounded. One of the things we did is, as we looked at coastal flood risk is we went beyond sea level rise. So we have a chapter on sea level rise, we have a chapter on changing nature of coastal storms, a chapter on groundwater rise, which you're going to hear much more about when uh, Dr. Jane Knott comes and talks to you sometime in April or May, June. Um, uh, so groundwater rise is a huge challenge. As sea level goes up, it's pushing up the groundwater from below that can lead to flooding much farther inland than you would expect just from flooding from uh, waves on the surface. We have a chapter on precipitation and a chapter on freshwater flooding. And we broke this down into a whole suite of key messages. I'm just going to focus on, I can't talk about the whole report. I don't have the time. I don't think you probably have the patience. Uh, but it's available for you to read. But I'm going to talk about sea level rise and about precipitation. So the most important point I can make about sea level rise, amid all the uncertainty about how fast it might rise, is that sea level is going up for centuries, and it's going to go up by many, many feet, dozens of feet over that time period. There are some glaciologists that suggest we've already passed the tipping point where most of Greenland is going to melt and West Antarctica is going to melt, which is about 40 feet of sea level rise. It's not going to happen next year, it's not going to happen this century, but sea levels are going up for centuries. And how you think about what your town does in the future, well beyond your lifetimes, I would argue really needs to absorb that piece of information. The way that the coast looks today is not the way that the coast is going to look 100 years from now, and certainly not the way it's going to look 200 years from now. There is no uncertainty in that statement. All the uncertainty is about how much by when, and I wish we could give you a better answer. I'm going to show you my best estimate, but sea levels are going up for a long time. Anybody unclear on that message? <laughs> uh, and the, then the second big message was that it's really this mass loss from Greenland and Antarctica that are driving that change, and the biggest uncertainty is going to be Antarctica, and that right relative sea level rise is protected to rise for centuries. And then uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to precipitation on my last slide. Uh, you can just go right through this. All right. So why does sea level rise? And this might get a little technical, but this is really close to my heart, and I just wrote the report. So there's lots of reasons that sea level rise. I've, I've mentioned two already, is that warmer water causes uh, sea level to rise, and that the transfer of ice from big ice sheets and glaciers into the ocean drives sea level rise. There's also this weird response to having all this weight sitting on the crust uh, from the big ice sheets that were here. As those as those ice sheets retreated, the crust actually bounced back up. And now in this complex reaction of that, the inland is still rising, but the coast is subsiding. 
What we're really lucky about is sort of from Portland to Portsmouth, it's pretty small. If you go down to Maryland, it's really big. If you go down to South Carolina, half of their relative sea level rise is coming from the fact the coast is sinking. So that alone, be glad you don't own property in South Carolina on the coast. Um, so what we did as part of this report was, I, I didn't do it, but I got results from, uh, from Bob Kopp at Rutgers University, who's a sort of global expert on this topic. And we looked at all the different causes of sea level rise under this scenario called COP14, because Bob Kopp wrote the paper in 2014, and under this uh, lower emission scenario. So optimistic scenario, right? The RCP 4.5, lower emissions. So the orange line represents thermal expansion. Uh, the red line here uh, represents glaciers and ice caps. The blue line represents contributions from the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, oh, uh, the purple line is dynamic sea level. So as we have changes in ocean circulation in the North Atlantic, we can expect changes in sea level. Uh, it's, it all has to do with changes in the Gulf Stream and changes in the formation of North Atlantic deep water. So that's dynamic sea level change. Um, uh, land water storage, as we build big dams or we release big dams, we change the amount of water in the ocean. Um, the blue line is the Greenland ice sheet and geo is that coastal subsidence. All right, so these are all the individual components. And in this model, under COP14, RCP 4.5, you still see by 2100 that uh, thermal expansion is still the single largest. But if you add up Antarctica, uh, sorry, glaciers and ice caps, which are non-Antarctica and Greenland, Antarctica and Greenland, those three are bigger than the thermal expansion. All right, lots of detail. <laughs> Next slide. So we've taken this, I would say, rather conservative estimate of the RCP 4.5 and COP 2014, and we developed a probabilistic assessment of how sea level would rise in the future. Again, we didn't do, develop it. Bob Kopp developed this. But it was applied for the tidal gauge at CV Island. And so what you're seeing down here in the blue line represents uh, the central estimate, sorry, Four represents the central estimate. Three to five represents what we would suggest is the most likely range for sea level rise, right? Out from uh, 2018 out to 2150. So the graph goes out to 2150. So we're putting a 67% probability on that based on the probability distribution function of all those different processes that I talked about in the previous slide. Make sense? But we're also saying, look, there's a 1 in 20 chance that it could be actually right outside of that central estimate. Uh, so by 2150, it could be up around 6 feet. We've got a 1 in, two, uh, a one in 100, a 1 in 200, and a 1 in 1,000 chance. So uh, let me, let's just take it. We took the 1 in 1,000 chance by 2100. We're suggesting that sea level could be as high as 9 feet. 1 in 1,000 chance, very unlikely but possible. And uh, one of the things that we've, th the reason we did that is this because in our guidance for what to do about sea level rise is we have indicated that the first thing you need to do is assess your appetite for risk, for flood risk. That's what you need to decide about on, your, on whatever piece of infrastructure that you have. Once you decide what your appetite for risk is, I can tell you how you should prepare for sea level rise. If you're going to build an oyster shack on the beach, maybe you have a really high tolerance for flood risk, so you can start preparing for our central estimate. So, right, 2100, you're looking at the range of two to three feet. If you're building, say, a new wastewater treatment plant that you are very sure you don't want to flood, you might want to start thinking about at least the one in 100 chance, but maybe you even think about the one in 1,000 chance because you don't want to have to rebuild that again because it's such a huge capital expenditure. Uh, so we think that this approach actually provides communities with a really good way to, to force themselves to think about what their risk tolerance is and then apply the sea level curves that we've developed. I'll reiterate that this is for RCP 4.5. And so this is a conservative estimate. And so for me, these are lower estimates, but also something that we know that the science is changing and we have to update this report every five years. So if we find that Greenland is, is disintegrating much more rapidly, we will be able to adjust these upwards, but I am quite sure we will not be adjusting any of these values downwards.
which we thought was a very prudent way to approach the challenge in a pretty conservative state like New Hampshire. All right, so uh, I, I, I've, you've seen this graph already. I just want to show you if you use a different model that has a different set of assumptions about what happens in Antarctica, and if you're really interested, I can talk about the physics of this, but it has everything to do with the fact that Antarctica has these really big ice shelves that are really high. And as those ice shelves melt backwards, they get higher because the ground underneath the ice shelves is sloping backwards. It's a reverse slope. So as they melt, they get bigger. And, and ice faces that are 600 and 800 feet high are fundamentally unstable. And we don't have the physics to figure out how quickly they will disintegrate. It is, it is a fundamental problem that we cannot solve. So there's different assumptions at how quickly those will disintegrate. So if you take this, these assumptions uh, from this really famous paper now uh, by Rob DeCanto uh, and Pollard uh, in 2016, DP16, you can see that that blue line, Antarctic ice sheet, is completely different, right? Down here, by 2150, it's contributing like less, about a third of a foot. Under the DeCanto and pa Pollard approach, again, this is still RCP 4.5, it's not even the really high scenario, they're suggesting that by uh, 2150, Antarctica could, be, could have contributed three feet of sea level rise on its own. So we used this model, we didn't use this model. Next slide. Uh, so it's sort of a word of caution, and it comes back to this point that we're going to be updating this every five years. In our estimates, uh, this is, I know this is a really complex table, and you can, uh, it, it's in the report, uh, but I, I do want to go through it a little bit because we've got the year 2030, 2050. We don't break out the scenarios because there's not much difference in the low emissions, middle emissions, high emissions scenario. They're all pretty similar. So these are really robust estimates on how much sea level rise is going to go up. That's sort of like the temperature. We're very confident in these numbers that uh, the central estimate, so uh, by 2030 we go up another half foot. Uh, sorry, this, these are, uh, this is increase in sea level from 2000. So this is half a foot and then a foot uh, by, by 2050. And there's your 67% probability range, right? 0.3 to 0.7 feet. 0.5 to 1.3 feet. Uh, when you get out to 2100, what emissions there are actually count. Can you just hit that? So that's that one. The next one, right, for the 67% probability, if we put more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, sea level is going to go up more. And we've quantified those. And that's, again, for the likely range, if you look at the 1 to 100 chance, right, we're talking about... Um, by 2100, sea levels going up in the range of five feet under the lower emission scenario, 6.5 feet under the higher emission scenario, there's a one in 100 chance that could happen, right? It's not likely, but possible, and we prepare for a lot of one in 100 uh, uh, year events all the time. In fact, all of you, I am, I am quite sure I can make this statement, that all of you actually have insurance for something that's less than a one in 3,000 chance event, which is fire insurance on your home. So just want to put that into perspective, right? So it's, what's the insurance that we have here? I'd say we don't have much right now. Hopefully I didn't completely confuse you. I wanted to introduce the concept. It is complicated, uh, but I do want to come back to the point that where you start is what is your risk tolerance? And then I can tell you what you should prepare for. Right, so it's, 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 it's well, it, it's, it, you might think of it of how what fires used to do to communities, like, right, the great fire in Portland, that, yeah. Although the other thing, I, I just heard this the other day from one of my colleagues, they said, that's not just happening in Maine, right? That's everywhere in the world that's going to be facing that. So, good, fair, fair point, point taken. Uh, so that we also looked at extreme precipitation events for Portsmouth going out in the future. Uh, so here's uh, annual winter, spring, summer, fall events. Two inches in 24 hours, four inches in 48 hours. Out 2010 to 2030, I'm, I've, I've taken the high emission scenario here, 8.5. We can see that the biggest change we see is right in these really big, 
used to be rare, but won't be so rare in the future. So we see an increase of 60% in those events. When we go out, uh, this should say uh, 2069 to, 29, uh, to 2100, we see an increase in about 120%. So more precipitation and more of that precipitation coming in big precipitation events. All right, on to my last slide. I'm doing pretty good on time, right? So uh, hopefully through this comprehensive planning process, you're gonna talk about different strategies, both to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt. One point I want to leave you with, I wanna be crystal clear on this. The most important adaptation strategy is to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions because it reduces how much climate change you have to adapt to. That's not just the Kennebunk thing, right? That's a global thing, but everybody needs to do it. It's not about waiting for the other guy to figure it out. All of us need to figure that out. Um, so mitigation is the most important adaptation. Go ahead. Uh, and I would argue that actually on my, on my optimistic days that climate change is the innovation opportunity of the 21st century because it requires so many of our, our systems of the way we think and the way we plan and the way we use energy to change. Next slide. So I am optimistic. I think we can address this, but we can't do it by doing one thing or two things. We have to do a lot of things. So I, I think about this now in terms of the spatial scales at which we have to act. I'm quite sure the country needs to act. And what I really want the federal government to do is not tell me how to deal with flooding in my backyard, but I really want them to put a price on carbon so that we can transition to a low carbon society really quickly. I also want them to figure out a way better way to do, run the national flood insurance program so that we move many more buildings out of risk. That, we need sort of federal dollars to do that. It's really hard to do at a state level or, or, a, um, or a municipal level. Regionally, I think of the Greenhouse Gas Initiative. I think about security associated with our regional transportation system, the interstates and the trains and our planes. There's lots that states can do, and I just want to say it's such a joy to have Janet Mills as our governor now, who has put climate change and dealing with it front and center. And then there's what cities and towns can do. We have to work at all these in order to address this problem. It's no one thing, it's all of them. And then we also need all these institutions to work, right? You cannot look to government to solve this problem. It is way too big. They don't have enough money. And right now, I just don't have a lot of faith in my federal government to do much of anything. They need to do some things, but we can't wait for them to act. We clearly need business to invest in this, and in many cases, businesses are taking the lead on this. And we also really need to think about what we invest our money in, and I would encourage all of you to interrogate your investments. Where we invest our money, that's gonna actually provide the resources to fund the revolution that we need to address this challenge. Nonprofits have a huge role to play, uh, from universities to art to our churches. Um, and then individuals and families need to act at all. So why don't I stop there, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Oh, I, I'm supposed to remind you uh, for the television to come up to the microphone to ask the question. <laughs>